Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, yeah, this, this uh, typical Southern California weather that we're having, right? <laughs> typical for me being from Mobile, Alabama, where this is just a light sprinkle. But uh, welcome, welcome to Forgotten Images. Welcome to uh, the industry production of what is one of the best African-American history celebrations, I believe, in, in, in all of Southern California especially when you look at the combination of what Laverne and Andy Street has put together, as well as what Sharon McLucas and her husband have put together in terms of the exhibit outside. Laverne was kind enough to offer PadNet TV and Long Beach Community Action Partnership the opportunity to share with you what I feel is a very profound overview that was entitled African American Leadership at a Crossroads. Uh, that document, was written by someone that you're going to get to know intimately in just a moment, Dr. Alex Norman, who's here. But when I read that document about African-American leadership at a crossroads and his perspective from starting with uh, leaders in our community, uh, such as uh, George Washington Carver, W.B. Du Bois, and uh, others that are strong leaders in their leadership styles, and he brought it all the way to today's uh, current environment in our communities, I, I thought, wow, if that's African-American leadership, what is the status of our African-American community, especially here in the city of Long Beach? And as I considered that, I thought, if we could partner with Andy Street to take advantage of this great event today, how profound would that be to share with you, our community, perspectives in what's going on on stage, but we also have on the side flip charts and notes so that you can share your perspective on each of the six indicators that Dr. Norman has mentioned in his report. So keep that in mind. So sit tight. We're going to give you an amazing show, especially for those of you who are here right now. You're going to be the voice of what was witnessed this morning in a very special way. My name is Derek Simpson. I'm the executive director of the Long Beach Community Action Partnership and PadNet TV. As a moderator on this first panel, and you will meet Mr. Errol Parker soon as the moderator on our second panel. So here we go. At age zero, a boy will be born into the world already knowing the meaning of being Poe. Stop. No. Initially see his world is portrayed to him as the best it could possibly be. Reminded every other day at school how lucky he was to live in suburbia, told he's probably the only black kid in the world to live in a house. So is it true all you people got at least one mouse in Yao's house? Hush. Hush now, Peter. Somebody's calling your name. It's fame, lame fame that could be named the national anthem of this country of a racist shame. At age seven, the boy has already captured his meaning of heaven, a place where life wouldn't be so hard on him and where no one would have to be poor and where there's no longer us and them, but all is one to be. We wake up to see that it's that same we that would see his mommy off to jail more, us doing the crying and them doing the charge and falsely you see. Then his mother's off to a jail cell and that little boy's off to a living hell. All I want for Christmas is my family. At age nine, the boy continually convinces himself that everything is gonna be fine. Mama's home and he's out of that home, but as is shown by this very poem, that little boy's only problem wasn't being alone in a home. Low stumped into the ironic high rises of the projects, the boy stands tall as he ducks low each night in a small apartment, hoping to avoid the constant products of the constant gunfire. Liar! exclaims the boy as he hears the vain officer tell his Sophia that a young man acted as if he had a gun. Liar! Again yells he because he saw the whole thing, you see. He witnessed that young man laughing with his friend. He witnessed that dirty cop come up from behind. And he witnessed the innocent person turn around casually to see whom this may be, just as he would he would very soon be in a place a little bit more heavenly. 
see. The boy stood there for what seemed like forever in that young man's final living place. And a mother cried there as her son died there. She tried to hold him in his last moments only to get mace in her face. At age 13, the boy will learn the harsh reality of being a poor teen. The ghetto is a little better than the projects, but the extremities of racism are now most clearly seen. Being the only person who seems to have a problem with someone saying that an entire group of people acts one certain way. Being the only heart screaming when black people go around meeting, greeting, and cheating themselves by calling each other niggas. Triggers popping right in front of the boy's eyes just because this poor, ignorant world wasn't born colorblind. They got people dying, mamas crying, and the world lying for which at this very moment, I'm the one rhyme. And you see, the boy knows that it is because of those that the eyes and the minds of the world are so closed now. Round about one or two in the morning, the boy remembers that he could not sleep, but not because of the constant blare of police sirens ringing and ringing and ringing. No, that boy was kept up by his sister singing. At night I cry about the same things. I don't know why I feel the same pain. God, why? At a present point in his life, the boy goes through just as much struggle and strife, but you see he promises himself that there will be no more of him trying to save the whole world single-handedly. The boy knows that it's not his fault that he went through the things he did, and as a matter of fact, if given another chance, he'd be that exact same kid. He also insists that there will be no more of him calling himself hating them. The boy knows that racism exists, but merely understanding that is not enough. What we must do, no matter how tough, is understand each other and that kind of stuff. So this is why I stand so high with my life story. In hopes of leading our world to a better day, you see, we have to do this one life story at a time. So may it begin with mine, a world with no more weeping and a wailing. That's the story I want to be telling. I wrote this poem entitled His Life Story over a decade ago. I woke up one morning with a sense of necessity to document my life's experiences because I believe then as I continue to today that the answer to racial inequality and injustice in America is rooted in communication. Through communication, we achieve understanding, and through understanding, we have a shot at love and compassion. My weapon in this fight for love and understanding is my black art, that art which is rooted in my distinctive experience as a black person living in American society. With that in mind, you may imagine my response several years ago when I read of George Schuyler's notion that black art cannot exist because black people and white people in America have the exact same experiences. In his 1926 essay entitled The Negro Art Holcomb, published in The Nation magazine, he said the following, quote, little of any merit has been written by and about Negroes that could not have been written by whites, end quote. This seems absolutely ridiculous to me. And as I began to construct my refutation and critique of Schuyler, I found that he was not alone in this notion against black art. Another black author, Jay Saunders Redding, wrote 25 years later in 1951 the following, quote, I hope this piece stands as the epilogue to whatever contribution I have made to the literature of the race. I want to get on to other things. I am tired of giving up my creative initiative to these demands. 
I don't know if I can make this clear, but the obligations imposed by race on the average educated or talented Negro, if it sounds immodest, it must, are vast and are at once too much. I think I am not alone, end quote. Redding and Schuyler are still not alone in these what I consider extravagant beliefs against black art. And yet I contend that in order for any true leader to arise in this society as it exists today, they must be a black artist in their own right. That is what I've devoted my artistic career to. By profession, I'm an opera singer. But as I continue through that career, I found that I cannot do this without some leg, some finger in the activism of my community. I moved to Southern California recently and joined in a position at Long Beach Opera. I'm project director for an initiative that I hope you all will support called Community Conversations, running once a month from February through June the first one being February 9th, for which I am the featured speaker, and then we have four other featured speakers leading up to an opera in which I will be a principal artist called Central Park Five, based on the story we all know too well. What I want to do today is position the words I read of Dr. Norman's beautiful, beautifully written text in my own experience as a black artist and what that looks like from an artistic point of view. And so I'm going to present a set for you um, in the style that I conceived to, to my knowledge. I, I don't know if anyone else in, in this country or abroad doing this type of uh, performative activism, I call it. And you'll notice that it includes poetry, it includes singing, and it also includes a message. So this next set, is going to include three different items. The first being an excerpt from W.E.B. Du Bois's, a text that Dr. Norman uses as well, um, 1903 text, The Souls of Black Folk. And this is his famous concept of double consciousness. If we don't know this concept, learn it, read it, have it in your heart. It is, in, to my understanding, the primary fundamental understanding of what it means to be black in America, even still today in 2019. I'll follow that by a spiritual entitled, Lord, How Come Me Here? And then finally, a poem by Langston Hughes called, I Too Sing America. I won't use the mic for this set. Please save your applause if you feel the need to applaud until the end of the three pieces. After the Egyptian and Indian, the Greek and Roman, the Teuton and Mongolian, the Negro, is a sort of seventh son. Born with a veil and gifted with second sight in this American world, a world which yields him no true self-consciousness, but only lets him see himself through the eyes of the other world. It is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness. This sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. One ever fills his shoes. An American, a Negro. Two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder.
They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes. But I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow, I'll be at the table with company. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen today. Besides, they'll see how beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. In contrast to the poetry of Langston Hughes, the poet for the last poem I'm going to present to you does not wish to sing America or sit at the table with his white brethren. Yet this particular speaker demands his own table and wants his own songs. This framework is one echoed by the Garveyites, the Black Nationalists, the Black Panthers, more recently, many factions of the Black Lives Matter movement. This idea against the white is right doctrine. Although I believe the poetry of Amiri Baraka, our last poet, is rooted in a sense of provocation, of hitting you to your core to get his message across, I think that this sort of an approach has a place in true American activism. Because so many of the sentiments of the black experience are raw, they're untold, they remain in our community. And so in this last poem entitled, Why is We Americans? I want you to gauge Amiri Baraka's message, a message of true freedom. This is a poem entitled, Why is We Americans? Thank you. Why is we Americans? Why is we Americans? Burita, burita.
what it is is what I've been, what I've seen through the school of me, and the, what it is is who it is, and what it is, what it is, what it is. I'm going to be in here if I want. Like I said, self-determination. But I ain't come from no foolish tribe. We want the fuel, the land. You can make it 300 years of blue chip stock in the entire operation. We want to be paid in a central bank. The average worker fall away for all those years we gave it for free. Plus, we want damage for all the killings and the fraud, the lynchings, the missing justice, the lies and frame of the unwarranted yellings, the tar and feathering, the character and race assassination, historical slander, ugly caricatures. For every sambo fetch and fetch it flick, we want to be paid. For every hurtful thing you did or said, for the land you took, for the rapes, all the rogue woods, and black Wall Street you destroyed, all the miseducation, God's law, segregated shack we live in, the disease that ate and killed us, the mad police that drilled us, for all the music and dances you stole, the styles, the language, the hip clothes you got, the careers you stopped. All these are suits, specific litigation that represent we be like we for reparations for damages paid to the Afro-American nation. Boogie-da, boogie-da, We want education for all of us and anyone else in the black belt hurt by slavery. For all the native people, even them poor white people you saw all the time is funny. All them Athens and days and days, them Beverly Hills villains who never got to no Beverly Hills, who never got to harbor on their grandfather's wheels. We want reparations for them right off. For the Mexicans whose land you stole. For all of North Mexico, you call it Texas, Arizona, California, and Mexico, Colorado. All that you got to give up. Autonomy and reparations to the Chicanos, the Native Americans whose souls you ripped out with their land. Give self determination, regional autonomy. That's what my weed is selling, not asking. And they're going to do the same when they demand it like us again, and they only put it name. Yeah, the education. That's by 200 years. But we want all the cash. We want a central stash, a central bank with democratically elected trustees, a board elected by us all to back out from the referendum we set up. What we want to spend it on to build that Malcolm sense of self determination and self reliance, self respect, self defense, the wheel of what the good Dr. Du Bois beat on true self consciousness. Simply the psychology of freedom. Then we can talk about the American. Then we can listen without the undercurrent and desire to protect your ass on fire. We will only talk of voluntary unity, of autonomy, as best of all with self-determination. If there is democracy in you, this is where it will be found. This is the only way we as Americans, this is the only truth that can be told. Otherwise, there is no future between us but war. And we as rather lovers and singers and dancers and poets and drummers and actors and runners of the elegant heartbeats of the sun flame. But we are also at the end of our silence and sit down. We are at the end of being under your ignorant smell, your intentional hell. Either give us our lives or plan to forfeit your own. <laughs> Thank you so much. I want to end with just a very short spiritual, and, and that will conclude my portion. Um, I'm so excited for the panels um, that are following. And this particular spiritual, you will notice, uh, speaks of the soul of the slave, the American slave. That is the Negro spiritual. Those are the songs our ancestors sang as a means to soothe an otherwise terrible, atrocious experience. 
And so in this last song, I, I won't say anything around it. In, in larger presentations, sometimes I, I present literature and, and give a, a bit of explication on the notion of God in the black community. But with this last spiritual, I will just leave it in the air. Leave it in the air with all that we've been through. Search in this last spiritual for the secondary message beyond the text, knowing that this is from the slave of American history. This is a spiritual entitled, Over My Head. Over my head, I hear music in the air. Over my head, I hear Over my head, I hear music in the air. There must be a God Darrell Akon, ladies and gentlemen. Come on, we can do better than that. That was amazing. What are your thoughts about what you just heard? Like, Dr. Norman, let's start with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, all I have to say is let the record show that a joyful noise has been raised this morning. <laughs> Amen. I mean, that was, it was just beautiful. Um, you know, so we, we don't, we sometimes forget the role of the poet, the griot, the musician, the storyteller in African-American life. Uh, the African tradition is that history is passed on oral, through the oral tradition. And uh, what Durrell did here today was uh, an exam example of how that gets, 
gets passed on, you know, through the poetry, through the song, through the storytelling. So all of Long Beach, all of California, all of the world should have heard that. Well, thanks to PatNet TV for those who aren't here. First of all, <laughs> we want you to be the disciples of this moment and go out and tell people what you just heard because we're blessed to have a treasure in our community that can deliver it in such a way. So thank you, Darrell, for coming down because you live in the LA area, if I'm not mistaken. So he drove down in the rain this morning to be here with us. So thank you for that. Uh, secondly, though they weren't here to see it in person, it will be on PadNet TV and we'll make sure that you get that information for the replay on Video On Demand. Ahmed, your thoughts. Yes. Um, what captured me is how he demonstrated with the paper that we were thrown away. And as he concluded, or took us to the next level, we picked ourselves up. Ah. Yeah. Ah, that's and that was symbolized. That was great symbolism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that was. I, frankly, I missed that. I thought he was just cleaning up. <laughs> <laughs> Life is a continuing education process for me, for sure. <laughs> for us all, for us all. For us all. So we have a limited amount of time because we have panels coming up after this gentleman, but I want to pay tribute and give it due respect in terms of the report. Dr. Norman, for those who are not aware, can you give us a, a summary of what the African American Leadership Crossroads document is about and what inspired you to write it? Well, it's really about my frustrations with understanding how when the stars are aligned and everything is in place, how we can miss an opportunity to advance and to move ourselves forward. Um, I guess it was 2012, 2013, the, uh, it was it five years ago? Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, that we had in this very building a state of Black Long Beach report in which I gathered historical data on Long Beach from 1900 to the present about the socioeconomic political standing of African Americans in Long Beach and detailed with data some of the problems that we had. And it was a call to action. And when no action uh, took place or followed up, over the years I just wondered why did it not happen? And what could we have done to make it happen? And those were the two questions that really nagged me for the next five years. So what I just decided to do was to start writing, you know, my own impressions. And as I began to write, I started thinking, I should approach this from a scholarly perspective because my bias was definitely that something should have happened but I wanted to step outside of that bias. And so I tried to be as objective as I could, and so that's why I did a historical analysis of the three themes that seem to pervade um, black communities in the, in the personas of uh, W.B. Du Bois, of uh, Marcus Garvey, and of Booker T. Washington. And those three themes, even though they were operating within the same context of racism, they saw things differently. And they competed with each other instead of banding together. And it was only until the civil rights movement, the modern civil rights movement, that we realized that we needed to form coalitions. And so um, with the leadership of Dr. King, uh, as a result of the Montgomery boycott, um, the major African-American organizations, the Urban League, and ACP, the National Council of Negro Women, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, all of those came together. And we advanced the most that we have ever advanced in civil rights history. So I wanted to put that into a framework that like the griot or the storyteller, uh, I could leave a, a chronicle of what happened and why it didn't happen, but raise the question, uh, can we have a conversation 
about how to make it happen. So in a summary, I think that's. Excellent summary. And Ahmed, I, I know you've lived in Long Beach for many years and actually are Cal State University Long Beach alumni. And we have the president of the university sitting in the audience at the moment as we speak. But when you read this document, what thoughts came to your mind, both from a national perspective and a local perspective? Well, the first thing, I appreciated the document because it was a good analysis as opposed to just chatter. And it, it made me understand how vulnerable the African-American community is and how fragile we are, like those pieces of paper, uh, in not being able to come together with a common interest. And if we really dig into what Dr. Norman has put to paper, it should be, in fact, I thought you was a physician <laughs> because he found the viruses that are hurting our community. And it's up to us to find the antidote. And these are some of the initial as I uh, uh, read his paper. And we met, we got together, and you know, um, I wanted us to move forward with really being able to define what leadership is, because as he indicated, it has changed faces over the years, but I think now we're into a third uh, experience that we have to put it together and be able to move forward. And we'll get more into this as we go along. Okay. Now, for those who haven't had a chance to read the entire document, um, there are six quality of life indicators that you mentioned. Uh, education, employment, housing, public health, public safety, and civic engagement. But I also read, and I want to read it as a quote, black Americans are among the poorest, least educated groups in Long Beach and also have the highest rates of incarceration and homelessness in the city. My question to both of you gentlemen as you hear that, and we know that as we live in this community, what are uh, some of the strategies or what are some of the things that you believe that we as a community should be considering uh, as remedies for the viruses that Ahmed just mentioned, uh, which some of this is systemic in? I'll defer to Ahmed on this. Again? Okay. Oh, I'm just an anesthesiologist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I can't do the surgery until the anesthesia is the I'm not going to put him to sleep. <laughs> um, you, know, you know, a lot of times as we embark in careers or in jobs, we identify with other folks and lose our identity or don't identify our identity. And what happens is it causes us to not maintain what we know about our powerful history and how strong we, we can be. Now, my son says uh, that uh, if, if you, we were strong kings and queens, what happened? So that doesn't mean anything unless it was perpetual. So we have to come together in some kind of groups or uh, entities to be able to develop positive leadership development and have developed a strategy because everyone's got to buy into it. You know, was... Uh, uh, W.E. Du Bois and Booker T, were they literary leaders or were they action leaders? That second phase had more action leaders. Right. So there's a difference. Mm -hmm. So it's still open to define leadership because how is it coming? Do I read about it and it inspires me or do I hear it and feel good? Mm -hmm. And I don't arrive at the third meeting. Right. I'm only at the first and second. Right. Thoughts, Dr. Norman? Well, 
and, and as Ahmed was uh, speaking, it kind of reminded me that one of the reasons that um, that we really don't get to that third level is because we don't build an intergenerational aspect to our leadership. Um, I have to say that I was one of the generation that benefited greatly from the previous generations. Um, they planted shade trees knowing full well that they weren't gonna sit in the shade. And uh, it was that kind of attitude that allowed me to benefit directly from the uh, people who sacrificed through lynchings and protests and marches and my ancestors. I mean, I'm the grandson of uh, free African descendants who were enslaved. So grandpa and grandma was a slave on both my sides. So it's not too far for me hearing the stories about Papa Charles and Uncle Willie you know, and Aunt Harriet and Grandma Jane. Uh, but that formed the context for me that I needed to plant some shade trees. And I think we need to plant those trees because that's what we didn't do even though we reaped the benefits of the civil rights movement, we forgot to build the sustainability of the leadership in our communities. Now, part of it has to do with technology because the technology changed, you know, and it had an impact on, on us that uh, made us more individualistic than community oriented. But uh, one of the things that I think would be helpful to us is if, as uh, Durrell pointed out to us that racism is always the context in which we are operating. And if we can remember that theme, then we'll know because that's systemic. That's the thread that runs through the American culture. And so it's not something that you get rid of. It's something that you adapt to, that you manage, that you evade, or that you build a different system in order to disengage from that which we're born into. Now, how do we do that? I don't know, it's like a buddy of mine said that during World War II, when the German U-boats uh, were uh, uh, threatening the, the seas, that the, the answer was just to bring the ocean to a boil. Yeah? Now, how do you bring the ocean to a boil? Yeah? So that's what, we, what we're dealing with. How do we do that? How do we build in that intergenerational core that has as its essence planting shade trees for the next generation? And when you talk about those trees, we're talking about leadership both in our community at a national level and at a local level. And I read that in the book that, or in the document that when you look at what's going on in our country right now, there doesn't seem to be that collective voice nationally or locally to address some of the issues that we have as a concern. Ahmed, when you, when you think about that, our national organizations, you, I, you wear a pen right now as the 100 black men and we have the NAACP and other historical organizations, but if there was something that those organizations might do or are doing, what might we lift up to say we need more of that or that is what's missing that we need to have those organizations focus on? to help us get more of those trees rooted. Well, that top organization, the Civil Rights Association, I hope it's still together, but that was a conglomerate of all the organizations. But the, the strategy has been avoided in terms of how to drill down because we have a whole generation that conspicuous consumption is just $400 Nike shoes. So, what do you do? Can you turn them around? I mean, it's it's the same as when we had uh, the division of field, yard, and house. So that division exists now generationally. So how do we bring in the the, the immediate generation is still with us so that what comes next has a great greater mentality to want to progress. I, 
I always tell uh, the Black Student Union Elders Association, it's our fault that high rises don't have names on it and we don't own the buildings. Too many sociologists. The mere fact that our local university had less than 3% in late 60s, and I look at the stats now and it's 3.9. So that means 50 years, have we gone backwards? even though Connolly spent a lot of effort removing affirmative action, but we've got to make our strategy so we have leverage when we negotiate. You can't negotiate if you have no leverage. I got a room full of people and I want 10,000 from each person. Anaheim is empty now, but we used to have all your eateries at least, and some shoe shop and radiator shop. We don't have that anymore. So where have we gone? Are we all selling insurance? So this has got to be part of our strategy for the 22nd century. Dr. Norman, when you talk about the, the elements of focus, one of them was civic engagement. And I know in our community right now, there is an effort to create an African American cultural center. Uh, there are other initiatives going on parallel with that. But what would your vision be for both of you, but we'll start with you. When you talk about civic engagement, what we are doing or what would you, what should be the next steps in that? Because the African American Convening Committee came out of, uh, as a result of the, the first document that you wrote, and as Ahmed said, from 3% to 3.9%, we basically went from 3% to, to backwards and no percent because that, that dissolved. Mm -hmm. We don't want to go backwards again. So from a civic engagement perspective, what might this community do collectively to move forward? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure what we have to do, but I can really look back over the past and see what has happened. For example, um, the Montgomery boycott was not national. That was local. Um, I think it was, who was it? Um, the politician, uh, Tip O'Neill, who said all politics was local. Right. I think all leadership is local. Leadership starts out local and it goes national. So in the same way that Montgomery it was a site that really ignited the modern civil rights movement. There's no reason why Long Beach can't be the site to ignite the, the new form of African-American leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a, a, a situation in which we have three uh, African-American congress uh, uh, Council uh, councilmen. Right. Well, you mean to tell me in, what, four years, we can't get the councilmen to come together around a black agenda, a black legislative agenda for the city. Mm -hmm. uh, again, that individualism that plagued Du Bois and uh, um, uh, Washington and, and Garvey is still with us. You know, we're still the individuals. You know, we do not see ourselves as a part of a people who are thrown away like the paper that he casts on the floor. We don't see the need to bring that paper back into, into one. And so I think there has to be, first of all, the intentionality okay. to place the community over personal achievement. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. yeah. Ahmed, you've been civically engaged in many different organizations over the years that I've known you. And I know that uh, being a part of organizations, both nonprofit and for profit, is a way also to help us move the agenda. I've often been told that you're either at the table or on the menu. And unfortunately, oftentimes, the African American community seems to be on the menu because decisions have been made by the time they hear about that. 
What would you say to those who are watching, especially that next generation, about the value and the need to get civically engaged so that they can be a part of planting those trees as opposed to watching what's built from the trees that were planted by others long, long ago? Well, I'll tell you, every, every, all seeds need some water. There you go. And since uh, those of us that are a little bit older, older and have seen some things, mm -hmm. we need to provide the water for this generation that's right here amongst us mm -hmm. that value what's on their feet greater than where they're going. Mm -hmm. And if we, we can figure out how to bring generations together, you got to have this intergenerational or there won't be any pyramids tomorrow. Yeah. So uh, the politicians, just being in politics alone, if you haven't been educated to how policy is made, and we've got to effect policy, mm -hmm. and it takes minds that understand that to come up with the policies, like, like in Sacramento, they used to have the phones in the basement and all the lobbyists would phone upstairs to their assembly person and senator to voice their interest or write up the legislation that they wanted pulled forward. And every time I notice when I bring this concept up to groups, either our mentality won't accept it or don't understand the decisions are made at the golf course at 5 a.m. when you're still asleep. Mm -hmm. So one, we're sleeping too late. <laughs> we need to get up earlier and do some thinking. Mm -hmm. My mother, she was an advocate for if the birds are singing when you wake up, you woke up late. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's going to take an all-around push on education in the house, out of the house, and in our minds, prenatal. So right now we're dealing with young people that need some prenatal training mm -hmm. so they can get on this ship mm -hmm. and understand the sun will continue to rise mm -hmm. and trees will continue to grow. Mm -hmm. Dr. Norman, um, there are so many elements uh, to what you've written and I know that you're involved with May, mm -hmm. which happens to be uh, an organization in the Cambodian community. Mm -hmm. And I know that you had a box of books entitled The Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome, and you introduced me to that book, and it's one of the most profound reads I've had in my adult life, mm -hmm. in my entire life. Mm -hmm. And can you share the, the uh, similar mm -hmm. trauma yeah. from a May perspective to an African-American or Cambodian perspective to an African-American community perspective. And I ask that question because Long Beach is such a diverse community. Mm -hmm. Though our focus and our intent is on our community, there is a lot of overlap here that uh, will move everyone forward if we could first be strong as a community within our own right. Well, well let me say first that I chose to move to Long Beach. Um, I was living in Pacific Palisades after living 20 years in Westwood when I was professor at UCLA in order to be close to the university. Then moving out to Santa Monica to downsize so we can get our kids out of the house so they could stop using it as a storage facility. <laughs> and then we moved further out into Palisades to get to a larger place once the kids had found out they weren't gonna come home anymore. But during that time, I came to Long Beach as a consultant on the uh, empowerment zone um, um, proposal and facilitated that. But one of the things I found was that people in Long Beach disagreed with each other, but they stayed at the table. And I went back and told my wife, I said, you know, uh, Long Beach has a tremendous amount of potential. And that's the kind of community I'd like to grow up in because um, it's large enough that it's an urban community, but it's small enough that you can get your arms around it. And so that's why I came here. So I wanted to specifically um, um, look for a community like this in which you can get your arms around at the time that I write my memoirs. Now it's 20 years later and I still haven't written those memoirs. And the reason is because of the activism. 
I got hooked on activism. And uh, one of the things that, um, that resulted in that was um, a relationship with the Cambodian American community. Uh, I was uh, part of a teaching uh, group that developed organizers. And one of the organizers was a Cambodian young woman who had been kidnapped uh, as a child by her mother to avoid her living with her father who wanted her to be more Western in her thinking. And her mother wanted her to be more like the Khmer Rouge, which was to be docile, to be quiet, you know, as a, as a woman. And uh, she was um, traumatized in the um, uh, refugee camp in Thailand, came to Long Beach, and somehow managed to use meditation, yoga, and trauma education as a way of overcoming her trauma. And she decided that she wanted to do something to give back to her community. So she gave back to her community by building a self-healing center based on a holistic approach to healing trauma. That if trauma story begins to heal the person, so she had to develop an approach where people could feel comfortable talking about the trauma that they had it experienced, even though it was painful because of the memories, uh, as a way of healing. And during that time, I was introduced to a book called The Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome by Joy DeGru, an assistant professor at uh, uh, Portland uh, State University. And during that uh, read, Joy DeGru uh, advanced a theory that a group that has been enslaved that faces continued uh, rejection and oppression will form post-traumatic slave syndromes. And three of those syndromes that she indicated would be lack of self-esteem. Another, she said, would be um, racial socialization, accepting the racial socialization of the oppressor. It's the double consciousness that Du Bois talked about, that the perception of the other becomes accepted by us rather than our own perception. In other words, we need to define who we are instead of allowing someone else to define who we are. And, and so I, I looked at, at uh, the Cambodians who had been enslaved for three years, and I noticed a similarity you know, that Cambodians suffer from a lack of self-esteem, as we do, you know. They were fearful of, don't wake the cat, you know. The cat is belled, so don't wake the cat. Let him sleep, you know. Don't uh, antagonize the city leaders. So looking at the similarity between the two, I began to use the same methods that she used. And lo and behold, I found that the intergenerational trauma that has been passed on down from the Cambodians who experienced the Khmer Rouge, beating their kids, making sure that they, their kids are under control by threatening them. I mean, black people will go to war over beating their kids as a way of raising them. That's passed down from the oppressive masters. The fact that, you know, you look at somebody the wrong way and they, we go to war with them because they look at the wrong, or step on our shoes or, or say something that we feel disrespects us, that's passed on down in the same way that Emmett Till is supposed to have looked the wrong way at a woman and it cost him his life. That's a part of the post-traumatic slave syndrome. So I began to look at that post-traumatic slave syndrome theory as a way of further distancing myself from the African-American convening committee and the negative experience that we had, negative in the sense that we didn't come out of it with some sense of organization. And I felt that we should have come out with a sense of organization because it wasn't a matter of lack of funds. It wasn't a matter of a lack of a venue. We had the venue, the leadership was there. It was a beautiful thing. We had 250 people in this place to hear that report, followed up by 60 or 70 people meeting around the table 
to figure out where do we go from here, even developing the elements of a strategic plan, and yet it didn't happen. And what DeGruy said was that one of the things that could happen was that one could be so paralyzed by the post-traumatic slave syndrome, not realizing that the ever-present anger that so many young black people feel could be turned inward. Or as James Baldwin said, the one thing that we need to do is recognize and manage that anger. Otherwise, that anger becomes a detriment to us. It gets us killed, gets us lynched, you know, gets us shot, gets us jailed. So in looking at, at that, um, uh, that syndrome, I su suggested that maybe that was one of the things that happened to us. That maybe as a community, we were so paralyzed by the intergenerational aspects of the post-traumatic slave syndrome that we were unable to take advantage of the opportunity. If that didn't get your attention, in addition to everything else that's been discussed, I don't know what will. We have less than three minutes remaining in your panel. Closing thoughts, gentlemen. We've talked about the trees. We've talked about the, the, the harvesting. We've talked about the plant. We've, all, we've gone all the way back. but. Looking forward, what would you like to leave this audience with as both here in this room and looking on as your vision for how we might move forward? Knowing the history, what's the future looking like for you, Ahmed, if we were to make this ship right and move forward as a community in the African-American community? Well, I think one of the first things is let's stop being distracted because we get distracted and once that happens, we're not able to look inward. I mean, as he mentioned, post-traumatic stress, there's still a lot of residue around, but people that come out of there, prisoner, war, whatever, you have a debriefing. Remember, we never got debriefed after slavery. <laughs> you know, the gate went down, some left, some stayed, but there was no debriefing. Yeah. So it's caused all this continuous, continuous holding on the habits of the plantation. So because of that, and education is so necessary, I'm going to say where you have captive audiences so we can have some kind of beginning is at the churches. There's a group of people that a lady told me the other day, I do whatever the minister says. We were coming out of IHOP. I do whatever the minister said. And I'm saying, you know, if that's the case, then every church should be a beehive. Yeah. Every minister should be teaching each person how to grow from Monday to Saturday. And you only come back on Sunday to get some water but not get stagnant so it becomes a feel-good session. We've got to have content. There, they could come up with some common mission and vision, dealing with how we address the world. Now, you know, I've, I've told some ministers, you know, Jesus uh, was self-employed. I say, why don't you cover that on Sunday? Yeah. <laughs> oh, leave me alone, our man. <laughs> you know, deal with that on civic engagement. We have to find a common interest. A con and it's going to be difficult, but we got to find a common interest that everyone can be a thread in that rope that can bind us. Mm -hmm. Leadership development, finding those key drivers and strategizing with some priority in each one. And in appreciating each other's personal attributes. Some brothers and sisters, I, I find myself not wanting to work with them, but I say, no, no, don't do that. That's a little bit slave mentality. Look for the good part in them. Look for the attributes you can work with that's in them. And then we have no problem. I have no problem. We all need to do that for sure. Yeah. And act, that'll lead to actionable insight that we can have with each other. And then our learning will becomes an accelerator. And as they say, each one teach one. Say something good to each other all the time. 
I don't care if you're at the bus stop, on the airplane, wherever you're at, say something to lift that other person up. Even if they don't want to talk, they'll talk. They'll talk. So it becomes a, let's take each other's hand. If we do that as a beginning, then we'll have leverage to go to the table and be in a diversified community. And I'm not going to apologize. We got a lot of in-house work to do. Right. And it's an inner, it's an inside thing. Right. But we have to do it if we're going to be respected by others and respected by ourselves first. We have to do that. Thank you, Ahmed. Thank you, Dr. Norman. We, we're out of time, but we're not out of things to say and things to <laughs> share. Good. Good. Uh, I want to thank you as an audience. Can we give them a round of applause? Yes. Yeah. Uh, you will notice on your way out that there, was, there are six flip charts. We encourage you all, please, to write down on a, a post-it, uh, and don't leave because we have our next panel already here, but we want to capture audience ideas as well. What you think are some of the things that we can do as a community in each of those areas. Please share your thoughts. Dr. Norman, thank you for your continued thank leadership you. in our community. Thank those of you who are watching on PadNet TV. We strive to be a constant source of local news, information, entertainment that you would enjoy and empower our community so that when you see it on the regional media, it's murder and mayhem about Long Beach, but we know there's a lot that's very good about Long Beach, and that's what we're here to share in audiences like this today. So thank you, gentlemen. We're a bit over time, but it was well worth it, and continue the good work. Again, applause for these guys. Thank you very much. Thank you.